All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's edition of Committee for Sydney Live. I'm Gabriel Metcalf. I'm the CEO of the Committee for Sydney. Um, our topic today is uh, COVID-19 and the opportunity for reforming government. So uh, to introduce this, um, we hear this phrase um, all the time, originally from Rahm Emanuel, um, don't let a crisis go to waste, um, paraphrasing him, of course. But, um, but it's, um, it's an idea that is deeply attractive to all of us who want to get big things done. It's the intuition that um, what is normally possible to do, the normal limitations, um, uh, are sometimes suspended, are sometimes changed during moments of crisis. And uh, we can think of times throughout history when big things were done um, during times of crisis that advanced a city or a country um, uh, long after the crisis. Don't let a crisis go to waste. But what does that mean exactly? What is it that needs to be done here now at this time? And does COVID really create new possibilities for reform? Um, to explore those questions, we have today two of the uh, most knowledgeable people you could imagine about um, politics and policy in Australia. Um, I, uh, as I introduce them, let me just make a caveat. Their biographies are so long and impressive that I'm basically going to just touch on a couple of highlights. Um, they may weave in more of their story into their remarks. Um, Dr. Martin Parkinson is the Chancellor of Macquarie University. He has served as Secretary to the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, between uh, January 2016 and August 2019, um, Secretary to the Australian Treasury from 2011 to 2014. Um, he was the inaugural Secretary of the Department of Climate Change um, starting in 2007 as well, in addition to many other things. Um, Chancellor, uh, Professor uh, Peter Shergold is the Chancellor of Western Sydney University. He is also Coordinator General for Refugee Settlement in New South Wales. Um, he also has a long career in the public sector, including as Secretary of the Prime Minister and Cabinet from 2003 to 2008. Um, we're going to start with Martin, um, and then uh, he'll share some thoughts. Then we'll turn to Peter. Um, all of you listening, um, you know how this works. You can submit questions via the Q&A app on Zoom, and I will do my best to sort through them. And uh, we'll have, a, uh, I think, a really interesting discussion. Um, all right, Martin, over to you. Thanks, Gabriel. Um, look, I'm going to start with uh, a few comments about the international context uh, and the domestic conditions that we were facing. Um, and I'm going to start basically uh, on the international side, where I think if it wasn't apparent before, it now needs to be widely recognised the world has changed irrevocably over the last decade. We, we had a period after the end of, um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, so the end of the Cold War, where the US and the countries of the West were... Uh, undoubtedly strategically, economically dominant. Um, yet today, uh, I think it's fair to say that both the United States and the countries of the West are in a far weaker strategic position than they have been um, in decades. Uh, now, you might wonder how does this get to government? It, this is all going to be about contextualising the environment in which government has to operate. So let, let me spend a few minutes on this. Uh, the US is clearly the preeminent um, economic and military power. Uh, but what it's, how it's happened is that its advantages have been eroded incredibly rapidly by the rise of China uh, and other uh, emerging market economies uh, in an economic sense, and also by um, those developing or emerging market economies 
becoming um, more uh, robust in their own uh, military and strategic posture. Partly this goes back to the GFC, where the model of Western liberal democracy combined with market economics was damaged in the eyes of many countries. Uh, and indeed, um, if you think back to the, just before the GFC, um, from 1990 through to the mid 2000s, you could see across the world autocratic or at least non-democratic regimes moving more and more towards um, a market-oriented approach. So they weren't becoming democracies, but they were definitely moving in uh, the direction of allowing markets to uh, allocate resources. But the widespread policy, regulatory and governance failures that the GFC revealed um, saw uh, that model lose a lot of attractiveness to, uh, to the countries that were uh, emerging. Um, at the same time, in our own countries and in in, amongst our own publics in the West, we saw a sharp erosion of trust in the institutions of power, government, bureaucracies, business, churches, the media, and so on. Now, that shift was exacerbated by um, the apparent robustness of, and resilience of the Chinese Communist Party model during the GFC and, and immediately afterwards. Um, it, it absorbed those externally generated shocks um, and it came out of the other side of this when the economy was still growing and uh, still totally in control of its populace. So if you think prior to the GFC, non-democratic, autocratic regimes uh, were moving in the direction of market uh, liberalisation, uh, now they came out of this uh, market-based autocracy looked a lot more appealing than um, liberal Western democracy uh, with uh, a market orientation. Uh, now, the interesting question is, post-COVID, will that um, relative attractiveness of the autocratic regime uh, still, be, uh, still be there? And I think it, it's going to be really interesting. Now, economists have long thought that uh, it's hard to reconcile um, sustained periods of economic growth with repression. And one of the great interesting challenges, interesting questions, which will, will only be uh, become apparent over time, is whether China and its reliance on technology as a form of repression uh, will that change that calculus that economists um, have always had? It does appear at the moment that, um, that the embrace of technology has sharply lowered the cost in terms of economic vitality foregone from um, repressive regimes. But we'll need to wait and see. Uh, second, the, the, the second point that, that's worth remembering here is while it wasn't anticipated at the time, the ascension of Xi Jinping in 2012 changed the direction of policy in China. Um, it really reversed that gradual loosening up and more um, voices in uh, the social democratic debate in China. Um, it became more militarily muscular and diplomatically assertive. Uh, and it's become much more willing to interfere in. Uh, the internal dynamics of other nations. So the Chinese have long prided themselves on, we don't interfere in your country, you don't interfere in ours. But um, in the last uh, half dozen years or so in particular, it's been making conscious efforts to draw countries into its orbit and using the coercive power of its trading relationships because it is the biggest trading partner with almost every country in the world, um, it's been using that to try and cow uh, individual countries. Uh, now, Australia's recent experience with that is, um, uh, is, as we're seeing at the moment, is not unusual. I, I mean, we are now being treated in the same way that in the past, Japan, South Korea, Canada, the little small island of Palau, New Zealand, uh, have all been treated. Uh, and a key part of the strategy there is uh, 
not just to punish the country that they're imposing the costs on, but to send a message to the rest of the world, don't mess with us because um, it will come at significant cost. Why am I saying all this? Because if you combine that with the loss of apparent willingness on the part of the United States to lead uh, global um, efforts, you find yourself in a situation where in this pandemic, where the US has walked away from the institutions that it established in the post-World War II era and which have served us so incredibly well. Um, President Trump is uh, the best um, transactional in his approach to engagement. He has a disdain for alliances. He's got a cavalier, almost imperious attitude towards um, his allies and their interests. And that's sharply eroded one of the great strategic advantages that the, that the West had, which was US soft power. So as we stand on the on the edge of um, the 2020s, we have a situation where uh, the US has lost its way, China is more um, muscular and more assertive, uh, and the world global power balance uh, and the rules of the international architecture are being rewritten. And it's not just they're being rewritten, the important issue is who's holding the pen. And the West is no longer holding the pen. Now, you can say that's a good thing, except if it's been replaced by somebody who wants to hold a pen in a way that is absolutely inimical to, um, to our and other interests. So Australia, in an international context, finds itself in an environment of strategic competition between the United States and China. Half of the world's um, submarine fleet is going to be operating in our region by the end of this decade. There has been a dramatic buildup in military presence and uh, a uh, willingness on the part of our major trading partner to try and coerce us away from our strategic alliance with the United States. Um, in short, we are in the midst of a negotiation around our national sovereignty with China. Uh, and we can no longer rely on the United States in the way that we, um, we could have done in the past. So that means that for any Australian government, irrespective of what political persuasion it is, they are going to have to negotiate this environment, and that is going to actually constrain their ability to do a lot of things that they might otherwise want to do. Jump to the domestic side, and what do we find sitting on the edge of um, the 2020s? Uh, we have had 28 years of uninterrupted economic growth on the back of a massive reform program that commenced um, it, it really did commence uh, with um, John Howard uh, attempting to establish the, um, the Campbell Committee and deregulate the banking system, but it never got any traction. And it was really Hawke and Keating from 83 onwards that gave that momentum direction, but supported by um, the dries on the, in the Liberal Party and uh, led by John Howard and, and John Hyde. Um, then when Howard wins the election in 96, um, you get another burst of reform. Um, and, you know, essentially by the time you get to about 2004, the election that Howard surprisingly won, um, that's the point where everybody pretty much hangs up their tools when it comes to thinking about economic reform. So we've gone for a good 16, 17 years with no significant reform. Um, and the fact that we've grown has really been because we've run down all of the benefits that we got out of those big, big reform program in the 80s and 90s and the first part of the, the 2000s. What has contributed to our growth, <coughs> though, has been um, uh, reliance on, on immigration, particularly skilled immigration. But if you think about what are the drivers of growth, uh, Ken Henry made this, this sort of um, uh, breakdown really well known when he was Secretary of Treasury. It's the three Ps, uh, population, participation, and productivity. 
Uh, we are going into a period now where our population growth is going to be very weak. Um, we are going, because because of immigration, and, uh, and I think Peter will, will talk a little bit more about this. Um, participation, we've got most of the benefits that we're going to get in terms of the kick to growth from rising female participation, and we've had declining older male participation for quite some time. So as um, uh, you know, famous reference in economics is um, in the long run, uh, productivity really is the driver of growth. And our productivity performance has been deteriorating uh, very, very sharply. We are currently running at about one quarter uh, of our um, long-term productivity growth rate. If we wanted to maintain the growth rate that we've had in living standards over the last 30 years, we would actually have to double. We'd have to have productivity growth that was double the long-term rate, whereas we're currently, we're at one quarter of the rate. So when we hit the COVID-19 recession, um, we are in a strategically much more complex environment where our capacities to undertake particular courses of action are going to be limited. And we are starting from an inherently weaker economic position than um, we have been uh, in the past. So I might just stop there in terms of framing remarks and pass to Peter. So thank you, Martin. And let me come in. And I am so pleased that uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Martin, provided that uh, historical context so convincingly. Uh, and I want to, I suppose, do same, same, but I think, I hope, uh, different. When I was thinking about today's theme, about what opportunities COVID-19 might present for creating a reforming government, it seemed to me there are actually two distinct but related issues. The first is how government is done, and the second is what governments can do. On the first, I think we've got to think about what opportunities are there for Australia to raise the standards of its government processes. What opportunities now might emerge to improve how governments take and communicate and deliver uh, public policy decisions. Can the challenges of responding to the pandemic transform how democratic governance is conducted in our nation? And on the second issue, what opportunities are there for Australia's governments to deliver a new, bold uh, reform agenda? for governments to be willing to risk political capital in addressing deep-seated, longer-term economic and social, and as Martin has said, diplomatic issues. Will we look back at this, our year of the plague, as a point in which governments and society are able to pivot, in which government leaders can reveal a willingness to be bold, in which citizens can be persuaded to follow, because that's equally important. The underlying question to both these facets is whether the twin challenges of the health and economic crises, the challenges of profound social disruption and dislocation, the challenges of public stress and public anxiety, represent an opportunity to bring about substantive change. So clearly, as Gabriel has indicated, this is a discussion premised on what has now become a sort of rather cliched proposition, which I think Gabriel uh, uh, attributed to uh, uh, Rahm Emanuel, uh, I, with a degree of in uncertainty, ascribed to Winston Churchill just before the Yalta conference, which is never let a good crisis go to waste. 
And that's the challenge we face. Whoever said it, the epithet does contain a great deal of wisdom. A genuine crisis, such as a pandemic, can present governments with challenges that are on a scale and are at a speed and with a ferocity that disrupt and undermine traditional institutional structures. It shakes to the foundations our usual ways of doing business. It threatens to overwhelm, uh, to overwhelm government's normal processes, how governments make policy and draft legislation and uh, undertake regulation, deliver programs, build public infrastructure, uh, collect revenues, make government transfer payments. All of those tend to be too slow and too narrowly circumscribed to deal effectively with a crisis on this scale. And the fact is, and we tend to forget this, in the hurly-burly of political contest, which media tends to focus on, most of government is actually remarkably routine. Even when there are new things, they tend to build relatively slowly on what has gone before, which is why the economic reforms that Martin was talking about with Hawke and Keating and early Howard were a bit different. In a sense, what we tend to forget is in Australia, a government in a sense works best uh, when it's seen least. That doesn't apply in a crisis. In a crisis, and I've got a few minor crises of my own. I remember being in authority during the Newcastle earthquake and the Canberra uh, bushfire and the Asian tsunami and uh, the Bali uh, terrorist attack. attack. In those situations, there is a need to move fast, uh, to think radical, to try things and, if necessary, to fail quickly, and to have a larger appetite uh, for risk. The fact is, and we've seen it in the early months of this pandemic, boldness is thrust upon governments. There's not much alternative. And yet, paradoxically, from my experience, it often takes you time to see through the fog of crisis and to discern exactly what's going on here. Indeed, one of the most important roles of governments, one of the most important role of public services in responding to a crisis is to try and collect the evidence and garner the expertise to help governments respond effectively. So, Will Australian governments now be able to manage the multifarious problems? Will the end result for Australia be for better or worse? And when the crisis sooner, I suspect later, subsides, will we be able to go back to business as usual and government as normal? Will the normal conventions of social life be restored? or? Or will circumstances be utterly altered? And will we have gained learnings which can contribute to a new and better normal? So, to return to my two themes, I imagine this lunchtime we'll want to discuss key elements of reforming government. You know, does a national cabinet suggest that there are more effective structures and strategies for uh, managing Commonwealth state relations in our complex federal structure. Can we restructure and redesign electoral processes to provide more stable government? Can, in this digital age, governments do far more to engage citizens in public policy formation? and delivering implementation. Can Australia move from what we've had since Federation, which is essentially uh, a representative democracy, into a more participatory democracy? And 
is the impartial, non-partisan profession of public administration, can that play a more facilitative role as stewards of the public interest in building cross-sectoral collaboration, in building public infrastructure or delivering public services? In other words, can the public sector evolve uh, to become a facilitator, not that it delivers it all itself, but it is able to bring together the private sector and the community sector with government. Then, of course, we've got the issue that I think we'll want to discuss of putting aside whether we can change and improve government, can we also imagine governments leading a bolder process of reform? How can governments build more satisfactory and less fraught relationships internationally in the way that Martin has been talking about? How we somehow balance our economic imperatives and strategic alliances, which have become fraught. I mean, I think when we look back, uh, the Howard government was able to do that quite well, but those were different days. Uh, can governments put our tax and revenue systems on a sounder financial basis? Can governments set the right, most cost-effective parameters to engage both science and business in significant reductions of our greenhouse emissions? Can we, through government leadership, do more to create an Australia in which high-tech, high value research-based manufacturing can have a larger role as the export values of our educational services and our tourism and our agriculture and mining are at risk of significant decline or certainly of increased volatility. And I think this is a great unanswered question. In fact, I think it's largely uh, not being asked at all at the moment. This is an extraordinary year for Australia. This is the first time in 75 years, the first time in three generations that we are going to run an economy in which there has not been large levels of immigration. Uh, both, well, initially, of course, up until the 20th century, largely permanent, increasingly largely temporary. What impacts that gonna have? But just a concluding comment then before handing over to discussion and questions. I gotta say, I think, honestly, there's a lot at stake here for Australia. Let us remember just how dire the situation was becoming before we went into the pandemic. And I'm not just talking about drought and bushfire, tragic though they were. What I'm talking about, and Martin has referred to it, is the clear decline in the last decade of public faith in our democratic system of government. In Australia, as Martin has already suggested, we've witnessed a significant decline in confidence in democracy, especially amongst the young, those under 30 years of age. We've seen a profound reduction in trust in the political class, so it's at a very low level now, but also, as Martin suggested, growing lack of confidence in business, in unions, in lawyers, in religious leaders, and yes, uh, in journalists. We've seen uh, an acceleration, I think in part because of the impact of social media, in political fragmentation and tribalism and this remarkable suspicion of political compromise and consensus. And then, of course, what we've seen globally is the return of the, uh, the strongmen of politics, this sort of autocratic leadership, this new techno-authoritarianism, a state control of people's lives, declining respect for uh, human rights, fake news, conspiratorial theses, uh, uh, populism, with political leaders 
tending to suggest that these profoundly wicked and complex public policy problems can have a single simple solution. You know, I remember back 30 years ago when the great American political scientist Francis Fukuyama uh, declared the end of history. And what he meant, of course, was that liberal democratic ideologies had won the global battle of ideas. Now, of course, liberal democratic values are under increasing attack. And I think history has restarted in earnest. So to me, I have to say that COVID-19 has brought flickers of renewed hope. Hope for people like me who believe deeply in our Westminster traditions of democratic governance. We have witnessed, I think, the ability of Australian leaders, political leaders, to take action fast, to be bold, to show a capacity to balance the responses of the health and economic crisis. We have, I think, seen a renewed respect for expertise and how it contributes to set government policy, not just now with public health, not just a few months ago with the leadership of emergency services, but I think more generally, a, a greater understanding of how expertise can contribute to the frank and fearless advice that governments need. I think we have seen greater recognition across the political spectrum in Australia of the value in this crisis of having a strong public sector, of having an effective safety net, of having good access to health care by world standards. And perhaps I'm wrong, but I think there is more of an understanding now of the value of a professional public administration able to serve successive governments with equal commitment. So I hope I'm not being too optimistic, but perhaps we can hope that we will go to the future with a greater public appreciation of what it needs to make democratic government work effectively. And if that can come out of this global tragedy, it will be a very important gain for us. Thanks. Wow. Um, all right, that gives us a great deal to think about. We have lots of good questions. I will get to as many of these as we can. Um, but there's a lot to interrogate here. Um, I'll start with a question about climate. Um, many people have noticed that um, this government seemed to take quite well to um, listening to scientists, explaining complicated uh, trade-offs and policy issues to the public, um, asking Australians to make a collective sacrifice for the greater good, um, funding uh, people who would be economically harmed to get through a difficult period. And if you add that all up, that seems to be the necessary ingredients to take action on climate change. Does this experience uh, with COVID, um, is there any reason to be hopeful that uh, at the federal level, uh, there could be a change in direction? On climate. Martin, you kick off. <laughs> um, I would love to be optimistic. Um, I, I think uh, I think the internal dynamics of the coalition, uh, the conservative parties, mean that um, they will have to address climate change indirectly. Um, that is uh, standing up and saying we're going to do these things to uh, deliver lower emissions uh, will, will be fraught for them. On the other hand, um, if you think about what's happening, uh, you've got a market-driven exit from coal, uh, 
So the, the electricity generators want out of, um, of coal. Uh, and most of our coal-fired power plants will be gone within the next 10 to 12 years. Um, you've got a market-driven shift to renewables, uh, but because of the way in which the electricity network was designed, and it's not a criticism, at the time the designers were doing this, they weren't thinking about climate change. It wasn't on, wasn't on their radar screen. Um, you've got a... Uh, an electricity network that at the moment um, is uh, unreliable uh, if you allow renewables to come in in the way that come in um, today. So a pathway here which would allow the coalition to deliver lower energy prices, a more reliable electricity network and reduce emissions would be through uh, using gas as a transition fuel. Uh, and you can see <clears throat> in the public commentary that um, they're edging up to a gas strategy. Now, part of the problem we've had in Australia has been that the states have banned um, gas exploration. Victoria is, um, uh, is chronic, banning, having, having banned both onshore and offshore um, conventional and unconventional gas. New South Wales, not much better. The Narrabri project um, has been in abeyance for years. Uh, and the consequence of that has been energy prices have been far higher than consumers need to face. The electricity network has been far less reliable <clears throat> than it needed to. And uh, coal-fired power stations are um, hanging around longer than they need to. So we end up with this terrible trilogy, trinity of um, uh, prices higher than they need to be, emissions higher than they need to be, reliability, reliability or security supply less than. Uh, so I think in the context of um, a pathway around uh, the gas uh, supply dilemma, um, you can get better outlook for emissions reductions, more reliable electricity and cheaper electricity. Will that be enough? No, it won't. But can they do more at the moment? Probably not. Uh, but at least if they won't put a price on carbon, um, and Peter and, and Ken Henry and others um, discussed all this in Four Corners on Monday night, um, if they won't put a price on carbon, investing in the technological changes that are necessary to get us to where we need to go, absolutely they can do, and they can package that up in a way that's um, acceptable to their own internal political dynamic. Uh, but we are not going to see, okay. we're not going to see the green um, recovery agenda that you can see in, in Europe, unfortunately. Let me just add one single comment, and it goes back to my uh, young adulthood as a professional economic historian. One of the things that I discovered <coughs> in my readings very quickly is that governments choose technologies very poorly. They make bad mistakes and they pay too much for good decisions. Mm -hmm. What governments can do best is to set in my view, market parameters to set a price on carbon, to establish an emissions trading scheme, and then lead them, leave the market to respond. And then the government be there to step in as it must step in, in order to meet the uh, disadvantages suffered by some industries or some uh, groups of uh, Australians. In other words, what government needs to do as it needs to do, and I think is doing quite well in response to COVID-19, is to create a degree of certainty and confidence for the future. Mm. If, and Gabriel, if I could just okay. come back me... on, on that point. But Peter is Peter's entirely right. And, um, you know, the, the role he and I played in designing uh, Australia's initial emissions trading scheme um, we, 
we're in this terrible dilemma, right, where putting a price on carbon has been parroted for, by so many people for so long as we're punishing you. When it's not. The whole point of a price on carbon is that it induces new technologies to be developed or accelerate their development. And then once they're there, it actually induces people to use them. So we've got a government yep. at the moment that will, that will throw money at those new technologies or some of them, um, but won't actually encourage people to use them. Yep. So that's, as Peter said, you know, it's not, uh, it's not the right, worst gonna... outcome, but it's not a good place to be. Um, I have so many great questions. I'm just going to jump in and change gears here. Um, uh, the third P, productivity. Um, uh, a bunch of questions about that. In your personal opinions, which reforms would be most impactful for unleashing productivity in the next, in the next phase of Australia's um, economic development? Oh, Peter can, can start. No, you got, you got Peter, you want to go first? You, you, you start because I think we've got to start with a capability set. Well, I think we, we do. I mean, I think, well, the first thing I think you always have to do uh, is to openly acknowledge, as Martin has set out, that this is a profound problem. The difficulty, in a sense, is, you know, when we look at our uh, sustained um, e economic growth, uh, to most Australians, it frankly seems like we're doing okay. Uh, it's quite difficult to create the informed political narrative that says, no, no, beneath the surface, uh, we have profound problems which are significantly going to affect our economic future. Unless we can find ways to uh, drive uh, improved uh, productivity, and it does relate to our capacity and our capability and the flexibility of our workforce and the extent to which we can drive innovation and the faith we have in using public research and attaching public research uh, to the decisions that private businesses make. Uh, look, one of the real problems we have here, of course, is that in a sense, we, we, we often are at the end of the uh, chain. Many of us who work in the private sector will know that very often, you know, if we're trying to develop our own research capacity on our own or with um, research organizations or universities, it is very difficult because the, the head office is not in Australia. And the head office, if it's interesting technology and research will want to take it back uh, out of Australia. That's a profound problem. It's one of the reasons that more than most countries, we are very reliant on public funding of the research that actually can contribute to public, uh, uh, if it can contribute to productivity. Martin? Yeah, I, look, I agree entirely. Um, I, I think there's, there's uh, a couple of sets of issues. One, you've got to work on the supply side so you've got to build the capability of Australians um, and the best way to do that uh, for those who are already here is education training retraining um, and constantly being focused on lifting the skill sets um, but a really important way for a country like Australia to get skills um, and have them paid for by other people is to actually make it easier to come to Australia if you're a skilled worker and what's the best pathway it's actually to allow um, foreign students to come to Australia uh, to study in our higher education institutions so they're paid that eventually their, their home country pays for their basic primary secondary education um, and then they pay Australia for their tertiary education and then we allow them to stay and we um, reap the benefits. Uh, but I would, be, I would be strongly arguing that we should um, stop all this nonsense about um, let's reduce the uh, immigration program. As Peter said at the outset, uh, we are going to have the first year 
uh, for 75 years where we will have almost no population growth. Uh, that, that, is, that is going to have massive economic ramifications. Um, rather than uh, saying this is a good thing, we should be saying, actually, here's an opportunity for us to double down on recruiting skilled migrants from around the yep. world. Um, people who are entrepreneurial, people who are well-educated, who are innovative, who are agile. The flip side on the, uh, uh, the other two areas is uh, I think we need um, a national strategy around um, moving to a more digitised economy. Uh, I think we've been quite slow at that. Um, that means more automation and that means that some jobs are at risk. But again, that goes back to the solution there is retraining, you know, the right sorts of education, right sorts of training, retraining. Um, and then the other thing, which neither of Peter or I have touched on, but um, one of the great things that was done in the last decade and then got buried is have a strategy for Asia. Yeah. We live in Asia. Asia is our neighbourhood. It's not a foreign place, but we don't have a coherent strategy. We don't have a coherent strategy to engage with Indonesia. We've got almost 300 million people living on our border. Um, and, you know, in the next 20 or 30 years, it's going to be one of the five biggest economies in the world. What are we doing? Are we getting in on the ground floor? Are we helping Indonesia to grow and develop? No. You know, Vietnam, if we're thinking about the strategic context, Indonesia, Vietnam, India, Japan, all help us in terms of balancing China. And I'll be very clear, the word is balance, not contain. But what are we actually doing to build the economic relationships? We've had the Varghese report on the opportunities for India, and there's now um, an Indian government counterpart to that being prepared. But again, what are we doing? We're talking about it, but not doing much. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Maybe that's the real, really big places for, for reform. Um, you, you may know that one of the Committee for Sydney's top, top priorities um, with government is giving foreign students a path to permanency um, along the lines you talked about. So we, um, we are very focused on what an incredible opportunity that is. All right, um, a, a, a geopolitical question for you. What about the EU and what about the UK? Is there an opportunity to do something more or different? with um, the, uh, the liberal democracies in that part of the world? Well, uh, clearly I think the answer is yes, but I think all uh, liberal democracies are frankly struggling now. You know, when we talk about the return of the strongmen of politics, it's not just in the create uh, one party states, uh, one party states and nations of the world, we see it in many a liberal democracies. I think, in fact, I think virtually all, whether or not they're Westminster or not, are struggling now with um, this renewed populism and fragmentation. Uh, you know, when I talked about 30 years ago with Francis Fukuyama, it always said it was 30 years ago that, of course, we had the introduction of the internet. And I think for many people like me, we thought, what a wonderful opportunity this was for democratic reinvigoration. I think many of us, you know, were excited by the, the Arab Spring. Of course, what we have discovered is, in a sense, the dark side of the digital age, the extent to which governments can use their powers through the media uh, to control and to control uh, any opposition. But I think it's a more profound problem we've got in our uh, democracies at the moment, and that is the way to which we uh, are curating our own worldview. You know, I, I come from a generation where at home and at university, you had to be, you know, stop having all these political arguments because that's what you did. Uh, you know, that was part of political discourse. What we've had now because of the way people make their own decisions about social media or have algorithms unbeknownst to them do it for them is increasingly only read and listen and watch people who predominantly share the same worldview. 
So then people are very surprised. How did Brexit happen? How did Trump get elected? Well, actually, it's because you are talking only within your own bubble. And I think that's been a genuine threat from democracy. It is contributing uh, to tribalization. And I think we've got all of, all of us to uh, respond to that. Martin, I'll leave you the, I think, what was the broader questions in terms of our relation to European and uh, countries in the UK. Yeah, look, um, let me start off. I, I couldn't agree more with what Peter said. I mean, this sort of um, echo chamber of only listening to people who already have the same views as you is um, inimical to the effective operation of democracies. Um, on, the, on, the broad, on the economic uh, dimension of the relationships, um, I think people, uh, and there are many who talk about this fantastic opportunity that um, Brexit was going to bring and this brilliant new set of trade opportunities, I would love to know what they're smoking. Um, Brexit, uh, pre-COVID, Brexit was going to lead to massive dislocation in the UK. Um, COVID has just accelerated that process. Uh, the UK is going to struggle for a very long time um, to find uh, markets that it can replace uh, its open access to Europe, uh, unless it's prepared to acquiesce to what the Europeans want. Um, and the sort of nationalistic parochialism that drove Brexit uh, makes it unlikely that they will do anything sensible in, in um, that space. Uh, so just ask yourself the questions, um, so what would we export to the UK? Uh, so our largest export, iron ore, nope. Um, coal, nope. Higher education, well, actually, they're our um, major competitor. You know, the Americans are way out ahead, and then it's us and the Brits and the Canadians. So uh, we're not going to be exporting massive amounts of higher ed there. Uh, tourism hard to see how you get more British tourists here or more Australian tourists in the UK. That relationship's already deep. Services, um, London is the headquarters of uh, the world's financial services sector. Mm, very limited opportunity there other than the margin. Um, ditto coming the other way. So in other words, you know, people say, okay, um, what about agricultural products? Well, why would we want to put um, frozen sheep, for example, and send it to the UK when we've got effectively an inexhaustible demand for our product willing to pay a higher price um, to the north of us. So I can see almost no uh, economic upside from Brexit for us. The Europeans uh, need, because of Brexit, they need to actually engage with us in a different way. And you can see that's what we've been doing with the negotiation of the FTA. Um, I think there are, there are big economic opportunities there, but in a way they will displace things that we're gonna lose elsewhere. So by all means, all right. um, build our relationships with both the EU and the UK, but recognize that you're not going to get uh, trade as a savior out of this. All right, this may be the last question and it's from a reporter, a very sharp question. Um, can you each give a concrete example of an economic reform uh, which you believe the government could sell to the public that would uh, help reverse Australia's long decline in productivity growth? Uh, Peter? I, yeah, I will start by actually saying that I think Martin has put his finger on one of them. Uh, that is to say, uh, by looking at the economics of migration. Look, the fact is that really for the last 15 years, and really unbeknownst to most Australians, there has been a significant move from permanent migration to temporary migration. Working holiday makers, of course, but also 
uh, skilled temporary migrants and of course overseas students. Uh, I think one of the great reforms would be, as Martin has suggested, to see this quite openly as one of the benefits that we in Australia uh, can gain from the supply of educational services and the export of educational services. And I suppose in this period of COVID, in this period where for 12 or 18 months there's likely to be very little migration, let's now use this as the opportunity, in a sense, to clear the decks. Let's use it to set the criteria right now for temporary migrants in Australia of what is going to be required of them to become permanent. It does go back. So I think the Committee for Sydney is right on the uh, pathways to permanency. And I think it is a small but very significant reform that government could drive. And I think with leadership, it's a narrative that would be easy to construct. I agree. I, I think it's um, it's all about nation building. Um, and so, Martin, l let me try to get you to pick a, a a different specific example of a productivity reform government could sell to the public. Well, okay. Um, one thing that we've done a lot of in the last um, fifteen twenty years is we've gummed up the wheels of commerce. So um, we have increased the amount of regulation uh, and we can talk about all sorts of different areas, but just take one. Um, the amount of extra effort that goes into screening uh, products being imported into, into Australia. Um, really important to have high quality standards, but equally, every time you say, we're going to do, we're going to put additional tests and requirements on um, for national security reasons, you actually uh, raise the transaction costs of, of trade. So we've got to get a better balance. Um, so in other words, uh, we need to back off a bit on the national security narrative and start to think about the economic security, the economic drivers narrative. Um, uh, and that takes you in a whole variety of, of areas. But I think um, there's, a, there's a lot of regulatory reform that could be done, uh, and most people would not even notice it had happened, but business would respond well. Okay. Um, all right. I hope that got you what you needed uh, to the reporter. Um, Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time to share some thoughts. Um, this has been a conversation that um, positions the current moment within the broad sweep of Australian political and economic history. And as people think about reform, as we think about the opportunities in this moment, that feels right. That it feels like we need to understand previous reform moments and how those happened, and think in an ambitious way about, about what really needs to be done, rather than starting with what feels politically, um, politically possible as the, as the first question. So thank you both for everything you um, are continuing to do in your leadership roles. Um, everyone else, uh, thank you for joining Committee for Sydney Live, and we will See you at the next one. Um, take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.